Okay. Hello. Um, so before I started talking about the text, I wanted to discuss the assignment that's due a week from Monday, I believe. Yeah, Monday, October 24th. That's a week from this coming Monday. So it's not due for a while, but I wanted to discuss it now because the next class will be on Wednesday next week. So uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a list of questions. Um, there's a list of four questions. And you're supposed to answer one of them in two to three pages. And uh, it's, you know, like, just try to answer the question. Uh, it's not like a paper where you have to have an introduction and a title and all that stuff like that. Um, uh, I mean, these questions are not super easy. <laughs> it's hard to come up with super easy questions about this stuff. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, uh, Obviously, I take that into account when I'm grading them, and I, you know, like see how how well people did in general, or take that into account. Uh, so I wouldn't be really worried about it. But if you look at the questions and you have questions about the questions, feel free to ask me. Um, um, oh, and right on that topic, I hope everyone uh, got the email that I'm. Well, I already had one yesterday and I'm gonna have an office Zoom office hour next Wednesday. And then after that, I'm gonna, I haven't decided the time yet, but I'm gonna have Zoom office hours on Mondays and in-person office hours on Tuesdays. Okay. Um, and let's see, is there anything else I should say about the assignment? It's due via Canvas. I think I remember to create the assignment. I better check, but um to create the canvas assignment i mean and uh so each question is keyed to a different part of the reading that we've done so far um and um they go up to the reading for today so you know that's why there's four of them basically uh i mean it doesn't mean that you have to answer the question using only stuff from that part of the reading, but it's like a question that's related to that part of the reading. Um, and yeah, and you can refer, I mean, the, so the best way to refer to the text is just be the, be the give the B page number, those B page numbers in the margin. If you can't figure that out and want to use the Kemp Smith page numbers, that's the okay to, I guess if you have some other edition, you want to use those page numbers, make sure I know which edition it is. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, are there any questions about that? Okay, so, um, so therefore, again, I'm going to begin by saying where we are in the text today. So, um, uh, I'm not going to keep writing up there in the Doctrine of Elements because the whole course is Doctrine of Elements. Okay. As I said, the Doctrine of the Method is short, is much shorter than that. We're not going to do any of it. So, um, but the Doctrine of Elements has two parts the transcendental aesthetic, the transcendental logic. So, we finished the transcendental aesthetic and now we're in the transcendental logic. Um, in the transcendental aesthetic, I'm going to actually start by saying something today about what transcendental means. But, um, but whatever transcendental means, transcendental aesthetic is about the possibility of synthetic a priori judgments based on the form of sensibility. So the fact that we have, um, so to speak, before any experience comes in. I mean, again, I keep emphasizing, it's important to remember there isn't really a time when we know something before experience comes in, but it's prior to experience in some other way. 
namely it's not based on experience, right? So, so to speak, before experience comes in, we have a form of sensibility, space, and time. Um, and because of that, we can make uh, synthetic a priori judgments based on that. Um, and those judgments are mathematical judgments. So the ones that are based on the fact that space is the form of our external intuition are geometrical, and the ones that are based on the form of our intuition in general, which that is what's common to, uh, I think this is really the right way to say it, what's common to internal and external sense, um, those judgments are, are, are arithmetic. All right, so anyway, so so like that's the part we've finished and that's what Kant thinks is the easier and less controversial part of what he's doing, right? Because he thinks, number one, everyone agrees we have synthetic a priori knowledge in mathematics. Although they may not have focused on the fact that it's synthetic rather than analytic, right? Because he says people before him didn't pay enough attention to that. Um, but, uh, but everyone agrees that we have substantive a priori knowledge in mathematics about this. And, uh, and also it's relatively easy to explain how having a pure form of sensibility results in knowing things about how objects of sensibility can be related a priori, right? I mean, they can only affect us in the way we're capable of being affected. So we can know a priori, that's how they're gonna affect us. That's like in a nutshell how it works. Um, now we're moving on to transcendental logic and the transcendental logic Kant thinks what he's gonna talk about here is both more controversial because he's going on the one hand, he's gonna say that we, we have a certain kind of a priori intellectual knowledge, metaphysical knowledge, which some people, namely empiricists, want to deny that. And he's going to say, on the other hand, that we don't have some other kind that the rationalists think we do. So both parts are controversial. Right? But also he thinks that this is harder to, um, to uh, get to work, or is, is trickier because um, um, uh, on the face of it, there's no reason the object has to affect us according to some rule that we make. And that's what concepts, right? They're like our rules. So uh, the object affects us according to its rule, not according to our rule. So this is much harder to understand concepts. And that's why most of the book is about this, right? So, and then the transcendental logic has two parts. And these are roughly equal sizes, right? Unlike some of these other divisions where one is much longer than the other. These are, these are both pretty long sections. This one is the logic of truth. This is about how we can have pure a priori knowledge. And this is the logic of illusion about the cases where we can't have it, but we tend to think we can. Okay, so we've just started the transcendental analytic. The transcendental analytic itself, I should have left more room here. The transcendental analytic, analytic itself has two parts. One is the analytic of concepts. And the other is the analytic of principles. So a principle is a kind of judgment. These are, this is basically division by concept versus judgment. What, what kind of judgment is a principle? A principle is like, a, you know, first judgment that other things are based on, right? That's like what principle means. So so when you say first principles, that's actually redundant. It means like first, first, right? So, um, right, because he's gonna talk about the, the analytic principle is gonna be about the fundamental um, 
things that we know a priori based on the form of the understanding, based on transcendental logic. And remember, our knowledge consists of judgments. So, like, so for example, the the judgment uh, every event has a cause is going to turn up as one of the principles that he proves the analytic. The analytic, but what comes before that is the analytic of concepts, where he tries to explain um, um, how it is that we have certain concepts that we know a priori refer to an object. So they're objectively valid, as he sometimes puts it, or they have objective reality, meaning they refer to something at least possible. And I mean, so in the case of an empirical concept, right, like the concept dog, how do we know it refers to something at least possible? Because we've experienced its object. So we know that the an empirical concept is objectively valid, a posteriori. We experience this object, and from that we learn that this is a valid concept. I mean, we we basically formed the concept at the same time we learned it was a valid concept. That's the way that works. But in the case of a, a pure a priori concept, um, we can't know that from experience. By definition. So this is about how we do know that. It's going to turn out, but I won't explain that yet. It's going to turn out that just by showing that we have these pure a priori concepts, well, I'll say roughly why. We know that these concepts refer to possible objects it's going to turn out that it's impossible for them to refer to any possible object unless our experience has certain characteristics. And the analytic of principles is going to, like, it's going to get these principles out of that, right? So it's going to be, like, unless every event has a cause, we wouldn't be able to apply the concept of cause and effect, roughly speaking. But we already showed that we can apply the concept of cause and effect. Therefore, every event has a cause. That's roughly how it's going to work. So, um, so, so this step, uh, at least in theory, is relatively simple. It turns out it's not simple at all. And I'll try. Uh, I'm not sure I can explain very well that why that is, but I'll talk about it when we get to. It. But you know, so like really, the hard thing happens here. And um, under here, there's two parts. So one is the part that people call the metaphysical deduction. People call it that because Kant himself calls it that at one point later on in the text. But the official title of it is the clue to the discovery of all pure concepts of the understanding. Some, some long thing like that. I might have left out a word or two. <laughs> but you can see why people prefer to call it the metaphysical deduction. <laughs> So, right, so there's the metaphysical deduction, and then there's the transcendental deduction. And here, it's already controversial what the division of labor between these two parts are. But the way I would put it is that the metaphysical de deduction um, gets uh, a list of all the concepts that. Um, If we have pure a priori concepts that are objectively valid, we're going to get a list of what the fundamental ones must be. And then the transcendental deduction is going to show that they're objectively valid. So the really the hardest part of the book, the heart of the whole argument is the transcendental art deduction. But we haven't got to that yet. Today we're talking about the metaphysical deduction. Okay, are there questions about that? I know it was just supposed to be where we are in the book, but I said more than I planned to. Are there questions about it? Yeah. Yeah, well, but it's it's concepts, not judgments, right? Yeah, 
and its concepts, well, were we born with them? I mean, no, right? Kant actually says at some point, explains that they they get awakened through our experience and then the understanding abstracts them and notes that they're pure, right? So like, um, you know, so like it's not a doctrine that these concepts are innate, which like, I mean, Locke's argument is pretty good against that, right? Where he says, you know, oh, really? So babies, when they're first born, know what cause and effect are and unity and plurality and, you know. So, uh, um, uh, but, so we, like, they only start working when we have the right experience, but but their validity is not based on experience. All right. Um, that was a good question. Are there other questions before I go on? Okay. So, um, so what is transcendental logic? That's the first thing we're going to talk about. And what is the word transcendental doing in practice? Um, well, uh, I mean, the first thing to say about it is what I said before, that it's usually easier to understand the contrast between transcendental something and something else something, right? So in this case, the contrast between transcendental logic and, uh, like pure, I mean, sorry, uh, general logic or sometimes called formal logic. So general or formal logic is, is basically what we usually call logic or what Aristotelians really call logic, I guess I should say, right? Like it's not way teaching Phil Nye. It's like Aristotle's logic. <laughs> it's about concepts, judgments, and syllogisms. Right, so like, how do you have to put three judgments together for it to be a valid conclusion? That type of thing. Um, so, uh, um, so transcendental logic is um, not the same as general or formal logic, and like. Rust, roughly speaking, the difference is this, and then I'm going to try to explain it in more detail and say what the word transcendental has to do with it. Um, the way Kant understands general or formal logic is that um, it's things we know um, because there are conditions that uh, concept has to meet in order to count as a concept at all. And really there's one condition Kant says, which is the principle of contradiction, right? The concept can't contradict itself. It can't contain contradictory marks or its rule, more generally speaking, it can't contradict itself. Um, a concept that contradicts itself the way Kant thinks about it and the way a lot of people think about it, although it's not the way Frege thought about it and therefore not the way a lot of contemporary people would think about it. The way Kant thinks about it is that a self-contradictory concept basically fails to be a concept, right? Like it fails to try to refer to it, basically. So before we even get to the question of whether it refers to an object or not, we're already stopped by the fact that it contradicts itself, so it's not good. And so it's like subjectively bad. It's bad regarded as um, a modification of the thinking mind without getting into the fact that as a representation, it's also supposed to have an object. Um, and that's, that's what I think, that's what, the word formal in when Kant calls this kind of logic formal, that's what the formal is doing in this, right? Remember, like the formal reality of the representation. So this is Descartes' terminology that the same Kant is picking up. That the formal reality of the representation is its, is its reality just as what it is itself, namely a modification of the mind. 
as opposed to its objective or uh, reality or matter or object. Objective reality is its ability to refer to an object. So formal logic doesn't get to this part because it's just asking, is it okay up here? Is it really a concept or not? So um Whereas transcendental logic is going to be about the general conditions on concepts such that they are able to refer to an object. Yeah. Um, so, so you so Kant would say formal logic fails this criteria because it shouldn't uh, refer to the objects in the refer to the objects like reality, the transcendental. Uh, does. <laughs> no, it's not that it's not that formal logic is bad, transcendental logic is good. Maybe I right, it's there Kant thinks there are two different branches of philosophy. One is formal logic, and he says it's short and dry, and it's all according to him, all based on the on the principle of contradiction. And it just develops the consequences of the principle of contradiction. So, so it's all based again on the fact that whether we, before we worry about how this, whether this can refer to a possible object, we look into it and to see, does it have the internal character that, we, that, that is, makes it fit to be a representation? And if it contradicts itself, the answer is no, right? So, um, and, um, um, you know, then you get consequences of that because, for example, if you have a judgment and the predicate contradicts the subject, then the same principle will tell you that the judgment is not good. And if the if that judgment can't possibly be true, then the um, uh, negation of that judgment must be true. So formal logic can tell you that certain things must be true, but all the things it will tell you must be true are analytic in concepts. They're all things where the opposite would be a contradiction. Right, so like if yellow is part of the definition of gold, then um, gold is not yellow. You don't have to have any experience of gold. You just have to know what's in the concept gold to know that this is false. Right, so we don't have to even worry about whether gold refers to a possible object or not. We just have to look into its definition or its rule, so to speak, and we see that it contradicts yellow. And from this, we can conclude, right? Because if you write this as no gold, I say, um, some gold is not yellow. This is necessarily false, and formal logic can show that. And therefore, formal logic can show. Is this necessarily true, right? Because if this has to be false, then this has to be true. Yeah. So in the analytic judgment, let's say, next formal uh, question. Well, so the, like Kant says, the principle of contradiction is the principle of all analytic judgments, right? So, yeah, so an analytic judgment, formal logic is the branch of. Uh, philosophy that explains how and when analytic judgments are possible. But Kant doesn't think that there's that anyone has any questions, right? He thinks that, that it was all it was all finished. It hasn't made a single step since Aristotle. Um, and even if some people seem to have added on interesting parts, he says those are all superfluous or you know are confused, are they bringing in things that don't belong to logic? Yeah. So, um, um, of course, like immediately after Kant, what happened? Everyone starts discovering new logic, like Hegel. <laughs> but 
anyway, um, that's hard to hear about. Well, although, I mean, in a way, you can see Hegel's logic as a kind of transcendental logic. I don't know about that. Right. So, um, um, right, so transcendental logic is going to be about the general conditions for a concept to have an object. Um, so what does that have to do with transcendental? Well, so, I mean, first of all, like one of the things that makes it hard to understand Kant's use of the term transcendental is that he calls a lot of different kinds of things transcendental. So like one thing he calls transcendental is sciences. Um, and here using science, like in a broad sense to mean like a branch of knowledge, right? Not necessarily like what we call science. But in the sense in which logic is a science, mathematics is a science, transcendental philosophy is, he's now saying, is a science, right? So some sciences are going to be called transcendental. I mean, in particular, transcendental philosophy and its branches, transcendental aesthetic and transcendental logic, are called transcendental. Another thing that's called transcendental is a use or employment. Of a representation. Um, and um, um, this actually is possibly the most common use he makes of it. So if you look on B81 on page 96 in Kemp Smith, um, kind of towards the, um, just past halfway down the page. The application of space to objects in general would likewise be transcendental, but if restricted solely to objects of sense, it is empirical. That's the distinction between a transcendental um, employment of a representation and an empirical employment. Right, so here it's transcendental versus formal, at least for the case of logics. Apparently, there is no such thing as formal aesthetic. Um, I don't think any of that is going to be like this. Here, it's transcendental versus empirical. Um, right, so what he's saying in that sentence I just read from B81 is that if it were legitimate to use the concept of space to uh, refer to objects in general, any object whatsoever, that would be a transcendental employment of it. Whereas using it to refer to possible objects of the senses is an empirical employment of it. Now, given what he, where he said we get the concept of space, namely from our pure form of sensible intuition, he's gonna say that it, uh, it doesn't have a um, possible transcendental employment, right? Because it's it, it it begins as a concept of possible objects of intuition, the concept of space. But uh, um, uh, but in the case of the categories, there's going to be a much more. That is, sorry, in the case of the these pure concepts that he's going to list in the metaphysical deduction, which are called categories, there's going to be a much harder question about whether they perhaps have a valid transcendental employment. Um, that's OK. So I mean, if you don't understand everything I just said, it's OK, because I'm just listing the different things that he calls transcendental. And finally, he calls like concept themselves transcendental. Um, I'm not sure he says what the opposite of transcendental in this sense is. It might be something like that or something, but anyway, he doesn't. But so, um, and in particular, he calls the pure categories with an understanding transcendental concepts. 
So like um, transcendental presumably doesn't mean the same thing in all these uses. But also presumably one of them is the primary usage and the others are derived from that. So it's like, this is Aristotle's example, like the word healthy, right? So like there's a lot of different things, you, kinds of things you can call healthy. For example, you could say this food is healthy. Or you could say this urine sample is healthy. Or you could say this animal is healthy. So healthy doesn't mean the same thing in those three cases, right? Like the food isn't healthy in the way the animal is healthy. The urine isn't healthy in the way the animal is healthy. But Aristotle says, so the primary meaning is when you when you apply it to the animal. Animal is what you know, like uh, primary sense is healthy or not. And then the other things are called healthy because of the relation to that, right? So like the food is healthy, it makes the animal healthy. The urine sample is healthy if it's a sign that the animal is healthy. And so, right? So presumably something like that is true here. And I think that this is the primary use. So why do I think that? Um, one reason is that uh, this is the context in which the, the word transcendental was used before Kant. So in medieval philosophy and uh, in early modern philosophy, uh, um, transcendental was used to talk about certain kind of concepts or predicates or properties. But I mean, I think Kant would, would, would want to mostly call them concepts. Um, which ones? Well, a transcendental concept the traditional definition is something like um, the predicate of beings as such. So it's, um, you know, like when you think about the dog, for example, uh, the, way, the health of the dog is a predicate of animals as such, right? The, the dog is healthy or not insofar as it's an animal. But like the weight of the dog is a predicate of bodies as such, right? Like you don't have to be an animal to have a weight. So like, you know, like even this book that's not an animal. So if you ask, is this book healthy or not? There's no answer, not in the primary sense, right? It can't be healthy the way an animal is healthy. But uh, um, so like healthiness is, is a predicate or a concept that's specific to animals. Whereas weight is a concept that is more general. It applies to bodies in general. And so like when you go back to the dog, it's both the dog, both an animal and a body that it's healthy insofar as it's an animal, whereas it has weight insofar as it's a body. So the, so the transcendental concepts are supposed to be ones that apply to things just insofar as they exist. <laughs> now, you may say, well, what's an example of that? Well, the most traditional example is the ones, uh, is the, well, the three that Kant discusses toward the end of today's reading in section 12, beginning on B113 or page 118 in Kemp Smith. Um, so it starts in the transcendental philosophy of the ancients, right? So the transcendental philosophy of the ancients, now he's using transcendental this way, but it appears that the transcendental philosophy of the ancients contains a list of transcendental concepts. In the Transcendental Philosophy of the Ancients, there is included yet another chapter concerning pure, pure, concerning pure concepts of the understanding, which, though not enumerated among the categories, must, on their view, be ranked as a priori concepts of objects. This, however, would amount to an increase in the number of categories and therefore is not feasible. 
They are propounded in the proposition so famous among the schoolmen, quod libit ens est unum verum bonum. Right, so unum means one, and verum means true, and bonum means good. And these are what are were known as the three convertible transcendentals. Convertible means that they're equivalent to being. Whatever is a being is also one, and whatever is one is, is a being. That one's the most obvious one. Like trying to understand uh, why these two are also convertible with being, you have to get more into Plato's metaphysics stuff, right? But um, and you have to ask what true means here. But like you know, rough, like the way Thomas Aquinas explains it is that every being is true because it is uh, every being is exactly adequate to its idea of the divine intellect. And every being is good because it's exactly adequate to its um, uh, representation of the divine will. Which, given that what the divine intellect and the divine will is, is really hard to understand. It's maybe not as helpful as that. <laughs> but in any case, it's right. Like you could say, every every being is true because it like truly is exactly what it is, <laughs> right? And every being is good because it's exactly what it's supposed to be. Um, insofar as it's merely a being. So, like, so, in, I, you, can you see why then you would say that these are predicates of beings as such? In this case, I think it's pretty easy to understand, right? I mean, if they're things that go along with being always, then uh, they're going to be predicates of being as such. However, Kant actually says about these three in that section I was reading that. These don't, these aren't true transcendental concepts. These are only subjective conditions on the possibility of concepts. And that the, the, the ancients and the schoolmen have confused them, and that's why they're trying to put them on the table where they don't belong. Um, so, what is the other chapter of the transcendental philosophy of the ancients and, or the schoolmen? And, like, the answer is that according to a lot of people, uh, uh, followers of John Duff Scotus, right, Scotists, and uh, although I don't use the same terminology, various kinds of Neoplatonists, there are other transcendental concepts, that is, there are other predicates of being as such that aren't convertible with being, but they're what's called disjunctive transcendental. So one example would be and effect. Another would be uh, finite and infinite. So, I mean, it's now it's a little harder to understand what the claim is, but the claim is that like every being is um, either a cause or an effect, just insofar as it's a being. And every being is finite or infinite, just insofar as it's a being. Um, well, these are like, this is something that appears on Kant's table of categories. Um, this basically appears on a two. And therefore, this basically appears on a two. Um, other things that would be on this list, like subject and accident, are on Kant's table. So, um, so all of this is why I think that Kant is actually taking over this traditional meaning of transcendental. Right, so he's saying the ancients had two parts of their transcendental philosophy. One was about the three convertible transcendentals, and the other bigger part was about the disjunctive transcendentals. And he's saying this part, although I can explain what they were thinking, I'm throwing out it doesn't belong in this part of philosophy. But this part is going to be my table of categories once I've like corrected and you know got the full list the right way. Um so um if I'm right about this what that means is that the categories 
are something like predicates of being as beings as such. And I think that is what Kant says about them, except with one important change. So I have to go ahead in the book to find a place where he says this clearly. This is B236, and it's in P294 in Kemp Smith. Um, he says, um, as the categories are the only objects which refer to objects in general, the, the end of the sentence is interesting, but the end of the sentence is, the distinguishing of an object, whether it is something or nothing, will proceed according to the order and under the guidance of the categories. So, but what I'm interested in is the beginning of the sentence, as the categories are the only concepts that refer to objects in general. Right, so categories are concepts that apply to objects and such. I think is what Kant is saying in that sentence I just read. So, I mean, how, like, what's the importance of this change and, like, how big of a change is it? I think uh, I might be able to say something about that later when we discuss what Kant himself said about the concept of being or existence, but we haven't really got to that yet. But, um, but anyway, this so this is what I think transcendental means in its primary use. So that's why I said if it had an opposite, the object the opposite would be something like special, right? That is, it's a concept that refers to only some kind of object, right? Or that that right, like healthy. Is not a predicate of objects itself as such, because it's only a predicate of objects of concepts of living things. So, you know, if my concept is a concept of a living thing, then whatever is its object will be healthy or not. Um, but if my concept, like the concept dog, right? But if it's the concept book, then what, what's its object won't be either healthy or unhealthy. Yeah. Like special could be a particular. Yeah. Yeah. Like particular might be another. Um, like I said, I don't think I, I don't know of a place where he uses a, a specific term to mean not transcendental. <laughs> so but something like that. Yeah. So um So then, like, going back to, well, first of all, this use is, right, as I, you know, as I said, if the concept space were to be used about objects in general, then it would be transcendent, that would be a transcendental employment of it. Right? So it's like using a concept of objects as such to refer to objects in general without any distinction of what kind of objects they are, meaning objects of what kind of cognitive faculty they are. Um, so the opposite is, in, is empirical where we use the concept the concept maybe itself is a concept of objects as such, but we use it to refer only to a certain kind of objects, namely the object of our type of sensible intuition. Empirical objects. Right, so if there's another, since we can conceive of, although we don't know it's possible, we can conceive of a being that doesn't have a sensible intuition, or that has a different kind of sensible in intuition than we do. Um, we're in a sense when we try to when we make that transcendental employment of the concept, we're including not only the objects of our type of sensible intuition, but also the conceivable objects of these other conceivable ways of knowing things other conceivable faculties. Um, whereas when we use, make the empirical use of it, 
we're only including the possible objects of our cognition. And Kant is going to say that not to get in the way uh, in advance, but Kant is going to say that only this employment is, is legitimate. When we try to use it to refer to objects in general, that's when we that's one of the ways we get into trouble in life. Okay, but I think more to the point now, because I'm still trying to say, explain what transcendental logic is or why it's called that. When you get to this, so um, remember, I said that transcendental logic is going to be about the conditions for um, a concept to refer to any object at all. So um, that science is called transcendental because um, it's not about all the special conditions that have to be in place to refer to particular types of objects. It's about whatever conditions have to be in place for us to refer to any object whatsoever. Um, and uh, um, and so if you look on page uh, B, it's the bottom of B79, it's on page 95. Um, Um, okay, so at the beginning here, this is, this is the beginning of his description of transcendental logic. General logic, as we have shown, abstracts from all content of knowledge, that is, from all referent, all relation, or I would translate reference, of knowledge to the object and considers only the logical form in the relation of any knowledge to other knowledge. That is, it treats of the form of thought in general. Right, so again, general logic abstracts from, that is like ignores basically, the question of how and whether the uh, concept we're talking about succeeds in referring to an object. So it treats only the form of thought and you know, the universal conditions that all concepts have to meet to count as concepts at all. That is, they have to not contradict themselves. Yeah. So to go back to the general logic, you think the general form of logic is something that doesn't trust the object? Yeah. It's not to refer to the object. Well, transcendental logic is about the reference to the object, right? It doesn't, it's not that it refers to the object, it's that it's interested in the question, how does reference to object happen, right? So skipping down a little bit farther into the page, in that case, we should have a logic in which we do not abstract from the entire content of knowledge. This other logic, which could, should contain solely the rules of the pure thought of an object, would exclude only those modes of knowledge which have empirical concept, content. So, um, um, so the so again, like the the reason transcendental logic is called transcendental is, I guess you say the reason it's called logic is, no, well, maybe I should. It's called logic because it's about the intellectual faculty, that is the use of concepts. Um, but uh, uh, um, the reason it's called transcendental is because it's about the universal conditions that concepts have to meet in order to possibly refer. And nothing beyond that. Anything beyond that is going to be um, empirical. 
explain why we can do that it has to be empirical? I mean, it's, uh, I erased this part, but it's going to come out of the way the transcendental deduction works, that um, you can only uh, show that the, like, the minimum conditions for reference have to be met. You can't get like more special things, like somehow prove that there have to be dogs <laughs> from the form of our understanding. Right, so anything more, any specific type of object we can only know is possible because we experience it. Does that, does that make sense? People are not looking very happy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, right, I was saying, oh, and I noticed that. Um, that um, transcendental logic does concern itself, unlike formal logic, transcendental logic does concern itself with how it's possible for our concepts to refer to an object. But uh, um, it stops with uh, only the most general conditions is that I, every concept has to meet in order to be able to refer to an object. It doesn't explain like what conditions have to be met in order for a concept to refer to an animal, for example, um, or to a body. Um, because and this is the thing I was saying at the end that maybe was, you know, this is the part that, that people got lost where I said that um, because the way the transcendental deduction works, right? Remember, the transcendental deduction is going to show that we have some concepts that we can know a priori possibly refer to an object. So the transcendental deduction is going to. Um, be based on the fact that these pure concepts of the understanding, the categories, are the minimum conditions for possible reference to an object. And on that basis, it's going to show that they must be objectively valid. But if you bring in a more special concept, like the concept animal, then um, that's always going to be uh, there will be no transcendental deduction of the concept animal. We won't be able to show a priori that we know there are or could be such thing as animals. So how do we know that there are or could be such thing as animals? Because we've experienced them, right? So what I'm saying is like the boundary between what's included in transcendental logic and what isn't is both the boundary, it's the boundary between the minimum conditions for reference to an object and any more special conditions. And it's also the boundary between what we can know a priori and what we can only know empirically. We can know a priori that the, um, that the most general conditions for our objects, our concepts to refer to objects are in place, but we can't know more than that a priori. To know more than that, we have to experience some actual object. Does that make it any clearer? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, um, right. So, like, if you ask, and the cross, uh, like, kind of list of the all this complicated list of all the different types of logic applied logic you know pure logic special logic general logic whatever famously things are kind of up in the air where transcendental logic fits is transcendental logic um completely general or is it special is it the logic is it rules for the use of the understanding with respect to a special kind of thing and the answer is it depends how you look at it 
uh, I think is why it's not clear where to put it. You can't add to the big thing. Well, it doesn't explain why Conference is saying more about that. But like it depends how you look at it. On the one hand, it's going to be about the most general conditions for us to refer to objects. Us means beings like ourselves, beings with a sensible intuition. And in the latter part of the transcendental deduction, it gets more specific, beings with our form of sensible intuition. Um, um, so, but th that, those are the only objects we can know. So transcendental logic, of, like, um, is the rules for the use of understanding in all the objects we can possibly know. So in that sense, it's completely general, just like formal. Yeah. Like, sometimes avoid it. I well, it's connected to why he avoids the examples. He wants you to pay attention to the abstract general case and and learn it. And he thinks the examples, although they can um, kind of like substitute for knowing the general rule. Distract you from actually learning it. Right. So one of the things he's going to say later is examples are the go kart of judgment. A go kart is like a it's like a walker, you know, like like a thing that you right like if you can't walk very well you can use it. So and like it like if you can't learn the general rule then you have, you'll have to have recourse to examples. But uh, but in, but it, but in transcendental philosophy the whole point is to learn the general rules. So. Um, uh, as, as I think, I don't remember what I said in this course, the other not, but as I think I said before, that, that also explains again why Hume is like happy to give lots of examples. Because Hume doesn't really believe you can know the general rule better than the examples, right? Like all you really know is the examples. <laughs> um, all right. So anyway, um, all right, where am I here? Right. So I'm just saying. So like, it's a spec. It's the rules for the use of the understanding in a special case, but the special case is the only case we know that's even possible, namely our own case. So that's why in a way it's general and in a way it's special. And that's, I mean, I'm saying that not just to resolve a difficulty about that text here, but to say that, like, I think that's a fundamental idea in the whole book. And it, you know, and it starts with the form, our form of sensibility. That's the key point. Our form of sensibility is only some form of sensibility. We can't show from the concept of a understanding that has attached to it a sensible intuition. We can't show that the, the sensible intuition must have a form of space. So we know that it's just so to speak, one possible kind of sensible intuition you could have. But we don't know any other examples. And we never will, right? It's not like we just haven't found out. It's impossible for us to even, well, it's impossible to imagine another example because the imagination is, like imagination is the faculty of representing an object in intuition, even when it isn't present. That involves space and time. We can't imagine another form of sensible intuition that isn't space and time. All we know about it is that it's not, there's no there's no contradiction in supposing that there's some other thing. Right. So like um, um that's like that's basic the class strategy of Sean. Like, remember what he wants to show in the long run is that we can know certain things a priori in advance about all the objects of our experience, but that we can't generalize that to things that are not objects of our experience. Right? So, like, um, um, 
the reason we can't generalize it is because when we when, like when we try to we make the concept of an object more general than just the object of our experience, we don't get any other cases. We don't get any other examples. Only that one that we already have. All right. I don't know. Maybe that's not. I guess I guess that's not clear. But maybe it will become clearer as we go along. All right. So all of that was about um, what transcendental logic is. Now I have to move on quickly to get to the table of categories, but are there questions before I? So, um, so like I said, the metaphysical deduction is trying to come up with a list of the fundamental, because fundamental, because Kant says there are also non fundamental ones that we can derive from the fundamental ones. But he also says he's not going to go into that in this book. So he wants a list of the fundamental, pure, a priori concepts of the understanding, which he also calls the category. Right? He uses the fundamental. Your a priori concepts of the understanding. And they're also, according to what I was just explaining, they're the fundamental transcendental concepts. Um, it's easier to call them categories. <laughs> Category is Aristotle's term, and Kant actually indicates doesn't he doesn't mention Aristotle all that often, but in this place he actually says that he's trying to do what Aristotle tried to do, but do it better. However, it's really complicated to explain how you have to understand Aristotle to make it look like Kant is doing the same thing as Aristotle. <laughs> so I'm not going to get into that. I'm just, uh, just going to point out that Kant also connects this with Aristotle's categories. Um, so, um, how are we going to get this list of concepts? Well, um, the way we're going to get it, Kant calls analytic. And so, I mean, you shouldn't confuse this use of analytic with the use when I talk about analytic versus synthetic judgment. This is a part of transcendental logic. It's, I mean, it's not a coincidence they're both called analytic, but it's not a very close relationship either. It's analytic to rate analysis means taking the part. Um, analytic judgments are called analytic because you can take apart the subject and find the predicate. Uh, and the transcendental analytic is called the transcendental analytic, Kant says, because um, uh, the way he's going to get this list of categories is to take apart, to analyze the understanding itself into its component parts. Um, Uh, that is it's in the introduction the transcendental analytic yeah so it's on b 90 by analytic of concepts i do not understand their their analysis that is the analysis of the concept But the hitherto rarely attempted dissection of the faculty of the understanding itself, in order to investigate the possibility of concepts a priori, by looking for, it should say it, I think, that is the possibility, by looking for it in the understanding alone. All right, so um, what does it mean that we're going to take apart the faculty of the understanding? 
um, um, it means basically like we have an intellectual faculty of representing empirical objects. That is, we have an ability to form empirical concepts. Because remember, the actual objects of our knowledge are always empirical, right? Like, to cognize anything, it has to affect me. To know anything, it has to affect me. So the actual objects of our knowledge are always empirical things. Um, so the understanding, like, all put together is the faculty of making empirical concepts. Or again, faculty means the same thing as like power, right? Or ability or capacity, the capacity to make empirical concepts. So the way conscious can be kept, the list of categories is to take apart the ability to make empirical concepts into like sub abilities, basically. In order to be able to make an empirical concept, I have to be able to represent something this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. So when you put them all back together, it's just, as Kant says, the understanding itself, the power of making empirical concepts. So, I mean, what that means about the categories is that, um, Um, a category is not exactly a, like a direct concept of an object. It's like an aspect that every actual concept of an object has to have in order to work as an empirical concept. So, like, here's some of the categories. So, like, suppose I, well, maybe dog is a too complicated example. Let me start with my favorite example is the concept of cinnabar. Todd uses this example from the other. Cinnabar is mercury sulfite, I think it's sulfide. Anyway, it's, a, it's like a hard, dark, Poisonous mineral. <laughs> it's poisonous because it has mercury in it. Anyway, um, sometimes we put a red dye, although obviously that's not a good idea. It's poisonous. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, the concept of cinema, like, so um, if this is going to be a good empirical concept, like, just for example, I must be able to represent all cinnabar as all the same thing. So I can say things like cinnabar is red. That means representing cinnabar as having unity or being one, one thing. On the other hand, I also have to be able to represent cinnabar as um, divisible somehow into more than one thing. So I can say things like some cinnabar is shiny. Apparently, like, apparently, like some cinnabar is shiny and some is uh, my my Wikipedia knowledge. <laughs> so um, I have to be able to represent cinnabar as more than one thing. Right, so so part of the capability of that, that that I that I need to make this concept is the capability to represent something as one, and another part is the capability to represent it as many. And then a final one that I'm not just going to add in. And the third one is always the hard one. <laughs> um, that. Uh, Totality. So, as I understand it, this is the way this works. Like, I have 
to be able to use the concept cinnabar to make a judgment like this cinnabar weighs five grams. So I have some cinnabar here. It weighs five grams. That's, that's not like saying cinnabar is red. Right? Saying cinnabar is red means everywhere cinnabar is all red. Right? But saying this cinnabar weighs five grams means the whole thing together is red. Right? Like it's not five grams throughout the way it's red here. It's a different kind of judgment. So this is a different way of representing symbol. It's not representing it all the same, nor is it just representing it as all different, right? It's representing it as like different up to some point and then collected back together into one. That's what the category of totality is. So like Kant says, for example, in our representation of the infinite, we use these two, but we don't have this one. Right? Our representation of the infinite is like this different, 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 but it never gets collected back into one totality. And that's why that last example, this cinnabar weighs five grams, is no longer about all cinnabar ever. It's about this cinnabar, because it's about some finer piece of cinnabar. Um, so, like, what I just did here is, I think, is a piece of the metaphysical deduction. The way the metaphysical deduction works is to say something like, well, how do you have to be able to use empirical concepts in judgments about the world? For example, you have to be able to use them to make universal judgments, like all cinnabar is red. You have to be able to use them to make particular judgments, like some cinnabar is shiny. And you have to be able to use them to make singular judgments, like this cinnabar here weighs five grams. Am I still? No, I'm not. Um, and the clue from the title, right, the actual title, which is not metaphysical deduction, again, the clue to the discovery of all the pure concepts that I'm in. The clue is that if we go, if we look at a list of all the kinds of judgments we have to be able to make, we can get from that the list of categories. Right, so that's why uh, at the beginning of this part, the metaphysical deduction, first of all, there's a table which people usually call the table of judgments. Although well, Kant himself calls it um, the, oh yeah, see, and I, and I see Kemp Smith put the title table of judgments in the, like, um, up here at the top of the page. But Kant doesn't actually use that. He calls it the table of logical functions of the understanding and judgments. <laughs> All right. But in any case, call it the table of judgments, right? So like at the beginning of the metaphysical deduction in section nine, there's a, there's a table that shows all the forms of judgments, functions of the understanding and judgments. And at the, at the top of that table is quantity of judgment and other quantity of universal particular singular. This is all on page uh, 107, and then there's some other text in between, and then we get to the table of categories, which looks just like the table of concepts, and at the top of that category is the category or categories of quantity, the way it's just one quantity, another quantity of unity plurality. Um, so that, as I understand it, is roughly speaking how it's supposed to work. Um, or at least, see, I mean, I've done, remember, I said another thing about Kant was that he does give an example, he even gives an example of the easiest case. And then leaves the rest as an exercise for the people. I think, you know, for the same reason, right? 
he like he wants you to if you want to understand them, you have to work out the harder cases yourself. So his you you won't be able to use his example as a go kart. <laughs> You'll be forced to walk on your own. Um, but so I'm doing the same thing here. I'm not going to go through this. This is the easiest thing to explain the way I'm trying to explain it. I'm not going to go through the whole table. There wouldn't be time for that anyway. But um, but I am going to write out the whole table because it's important to see it and talk about the structure. Um, and so the way Hunt always writes it in this weird diamond shape, right? there must be some good reason for that. I don't understand what the reason is for it, but he, he, he does it like all over the place. So it must be important. Uh, but I've never succeeded in understanding what the reason for it is. I like to write the table of categories this way. It has four headings. Quantity, quality, relation, and modality. These three headings are names of three of Aristotle's categories. Quantity, quality, and relation. So this is another place where Kant is, is claiming uh, some connection between his table and us. Um, modality uh, doesn't as clearly, I mean, there's nothing called modality in Aristotle's table, so it's more complicated to understand how to put that in. But then, you know, so I like to write that vertically, and then this all on the screen. Yes. Right, so like I've already written these you know, unity, plurality, and modality. Actually, I should have left more room here so I could also write the corresponding points of seven. Yes, I can write this one. Maybe I should make it bigger. Yeah. I mean, you can, if you can't read what I'm writing, which you probably can't, you can always look at the table in the book. So I'm, I'm just like reorganizing it here. Universal, particular, singular. Right, so again, like a universal judgment is something like all cinnabar is red. A particular judgment is something like some cinnabar is shiny. A singular judgment, like the type of example you usually see of a singular judgment is something like Socrates is mortal, right? Like with a proper name for the subject. It's a judgment about one thing. But um, I like the example, this cinnabar weighs five grams better because it shows how you can use a concept to make the, the subject of a singular judgment. How you have to be able to use an empirical concept to do it. All right, so in here we have reality, negation, and limit, corresponding to affirmative, negative, and infinite. Um, So, right, so an affirmative judgment is like, you know, all cinnabar is red. A negative judgment is like, all cinnabar is not red. <laughs> and the difference between a negative and infinite judgment is hard to understand. And in, I mean, what's clear is that somehow an infinite judgment is a judgment where the predicate is negative rather than. So, so it, it has the form of an affirmative judgment, but the predicate itself is negative. But how that's different from the negative judgment, that's what is hard to understand. I'm not going to try to explain it now because I don't have time. And also, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, um, I mean, and Kant discusses the answer. He uses the example the soul is not mortal, but 
but his discussion is really confusing because um, uh, it's not clear which he's calling the negative judgment or which he's calling the negative judgment. And there seems to be a problem in the text there. Like maybe there's a knot where there shouldn't be or something. So, um, but anyway, these there, there are these three things and then these corresponding three categories. So every object of an empirical concept, I have to be able to represent it as having a certain reality, a certain quali quality that makes it what it is. I also have to be able to represent it as not having a certain quality. Yeah. So for each of the universal unity, those are two boxes. No, these are opposites. These are what I'm doing is I'm writing those two tables together, right? So remember, there's like the table of judgments and the table of concepts. So I'm writing the judgment on top and the corresponding concept underneath. So then, quantity, quality, or the value are those part of each table? Right. Both tables have headings labeled quantity, quality, relation, and value. And on the actual table, they're in. Well, quantity, quality, relation, modality. In Aristotle's, in Aristotle's list, quantity also comes before quality, but in Hegel's logic, quality comes before quantity. The, the order is, I think, is actually important. Um, so maybe I'll talk about that, not today, but another time, like what this order means. Um, all right. So yeah, here's where I'm going to run out of space. But because each of these categories, well, okay. So first of all, I should say sometimes Kant calls these four things categories. Sometimes he calls these twelve things categories, and he calls these headings of the categories. Moreover, it doesn't seem to be random when he does that. Most often he calls these two categories, but then he breaks these two into the three categories each, right? So from some point of view, it's like there's uh, what does that make? eight categories, right? Like six plus two. Um, I mean, he certainly doesn't say that anywhere. Uh, but so I'm just saying, but I'm just saying that to excuse the fact that I'm going to do the same thing. Sometimes call these categories the category of quantity, the category of quality, the quality the category of relation, and sometimes these, which kind of calls the moments under each heading. Where he says under each heading there are three moments. Where the word moment comes from there, I don't know. It doesn't mean what we usually mean by moment. <laughs> Just uh, treated as a technical term for this threefold division of each heading. Um, and if you do, and also if you ever read Hegel, Hegel's logic will help you a lot because Hegel, everything is three moments, there's three moments. <laughs> it comes from Kant, but I don't know where Kant, where it comes from before. Me. So, anyway, so the three moments of relation are. Each one of them is a kind of relation. So it has like two terms here substance, accident, cause, effect. And then the third one, as we have it written here, Kant called community. So you don't really see the relation here. But in other places, he calls this the relationship of whole to part. Um, I mean, anyway, the way he describes the difference between cause and effect in community is that so uh, right substances have accidents which are like their temporary properties or states. So a substance is a cause, it's a cause of an accident in some other substance. It's not a cause of the other substance itself. So think of substances here as like, if this is a piece of cinnamon, and this is an animal, and you know, this is a change in the state of this substance here from healthy animal to unhealthy animal. <laughs> right. So um, 
This is the relation of cause and effect. But the relation of community is the fact that all the substances together determine each other's state simply reciprocal. So it so it's actually a relation between the substances rather than as opposed to cause and effect, it's a relation between the substance and the act. Um, if you didn't understand that, you're you're not alone this evening. So but I just wanted to say something about it. And this is supposed to correspond to the difference between hypothetical, or sorry, a categorical judgment. This is confusing because again it has sounds like a category, right? But it's not, it's a type of judgment. Categorical judgment, hypothetical, and disjunctive. Well, categorical judgment is like cinnabar is red. The hypothetical judgment is like if cinnabar is red, then some other judgment. God's example is if perfect justice exists, the obstinately wicked will be punished. <laughs> uh -huh. Which is more poetic than anything I can come up with in But uh, And finally, a disjunctive judgment is where you take several judgments and you say, like, exactly one of them has to be true. Right? So it's exclusive or, as we would now call it. So, you know. Kant's example in that case is it's interesting that his examples are almost always from ethics or metaphysics. He never gives he almost never gives examples of types of judgments for you. Like the actual judgments about empirical things that we really need to do. I don't know why that is, but anyway, his example here is like Either the world is, arose through chance or through internal necessity or through some external cause. That's a disjunctive judgment. Um, and then the final one here, modality. So, I mean, again, Kant writes two different things, possible and impossible. This relationship doesn't seem to be very similar to this relationship, <laughs> right? Substance, action, cause, effect. Here they're, they, here they're opposites, possible, impossible, actual, or existence versus, um, right there, right there. Um, contingent, no, that's necessary. Uh, Oh, non-existence, of course. Right. Okay. So, actual or existence versus existence versus non-existence, and necessary versus contingent. And this is supposed to correspond to the difference between um, problematical. Uh, rhetorical and apodictical judgments. So a problematic judgment is like entertaining the judgment that all cinnabar is red. So Kant, when does that happen? The concept, for example, the judgment inside the hypothetical judgment, if cinnabar is red, then, right? I'm not asserting that judgment. I'm just entertaining it as a possible judgment. To draw the consequences from. That's a problematic judgment. As opposed to if I just say by itself, cinnabar is red, then I'm asserting it. That's an assertory judgment. And an apodictic judgment means I'm, I'm proving it, I'm demonstrating it, I'm concluding that it must be true. Okay, so, like, I mean, you can definitely see some vague, if you look to this table, you can see in many of these cases some vague like analogy or like relationship between the form of judgment and the corresponding category. Um, what I was trying to explain, and what I tried to go through the detail here with it, it's uh, actually much closer than that. It's not like just an analogy. It's literally, as Kant says, it's the same function of the understanding 
So let's say I have a judgment all two of our red. So here's the concept red. Here's the concept cinnamon. So in order to form a universal judgment, like all cinnabar is red, I have to use the concept cinnabar to represent all the manifold things that could be cinnabar as one. And then that's what allows me to apply the predicate red in universal judgment and say all cinnabar is red. So the same function that of the understanding that unites the manifold of intuitions under a concept is also what allows the concept to be functioned in a universal judgment. So it's not just like it's not just like a universal judgment is kind of like unity. Or and then if you think about it that way, actually it starts to seem more to make more sense to switch from right? Isn't the universal judgment more like totality? And a lot of people do say you can switch, them, but I don't think that's right. Um so um you know uh um but so I'm not saying a universal judgment is kind of like a uh, concept applied to, a, to an object as one. I'm saying a universal judgment is possible in economics. Every, when I form any empirical concept, part of that is acquiring the ability to represent something as one. So it's part of the faculty of understanding, right? It's part of our power to form empirical concepts. Part of it is to um, acquire the ability to represent something that I've experienced as all the same as one. Um, that's one of the pieces you can take that faculty of heart into. And you can see that it has to have that piece because you have to be able to make this kind of check. You can see that any concept, any empirical concept to succeed in referring to any object has to, I have to use that piece when I form it. I have to use that part of my faculty of understanding when I form it. I have to gain the ability to represent everything um, that corresponds to that concept as all the same. So this is part of the minimum conditions for using concepts for beings like ourselves who know things empirically, this is part of the minimal conditions for using concepts to refer to something. Um, okay, I wanted to say more about the form of this table. Obviously, I won't have time to say that. Anymore. I think it's hard to say. The transcendental deduction is so important that I may not be able to eat into it, but maybe I'll talk about that a little bit at the beginning. But I'll just point out that Kant does say something, and this is part of the text that was added in the edition. Actually, he says something about like this structure here: why there are three moments under each one, and how they correspond to each other. And he says the third one is always a combination of the first with the second. Right. So they so you can't just mix them up in different orders. The order is important. Right, so, so for example, totality is a plurality considered together as one. That's the first one he explains. Um, uh, you're supposed to be able to do that as well, but I won't try to do that now. But I will just say one final thing, which is that again, if you're ever trying to understand Hegel, that's this that idea of what the relationship of the three moments is is key to understanding what Hegel is doing. All right, I will see you um, on Wednesday. Oh, soon. Okay, see you then. Thank you.